Good morning. How are we? We're a, we're a good looking group. Look at the smiles. Happy New Year. Uh, did you get some good presents for Christmas? Uh, See, there's been a couple of big events that occurred since our last meeting in November. Well, it was Christmas, New Year's, and my birthday. And you forgot it. You forgot it. It's the day after New Year's. Uh, this hat I got for my birthday. Now, normally I'd wear it backwards so I would look younger. Uh, but I wanted you to see the logo up here. It says, Old Guy's Rule. Uh, you agree with that? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> we got a bunch of good-looking guys, and we have some good-looking ladies, too, here. Uh, th that greeting of uh, how are we comes from a book. And I have that book here. This is what I got for Christmas. It's a prostate cancer book. Not really. It's a book that helps me with my prostate cancer. It's a bestseller, The Book of Joy. One of the authors has prostate cancer. The Book of Joy with the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. Uh, it's just a different uh, spiritual perspectives, but uh, there's a chapter here on uh, suffering and adversity. Uh, it's a good chapter for me and maybe for you too. In there, he talks about the greetings in some African village, which is rather than how are you, it's how are we. It's a village environment. And we kind of have a village here. You know, I missed you guys. Uh, it's been a while for me to uh, not see you, and so you're looking good, and I'm feeling good. And uh, one of the aspects that it's had inside is another label. It says, the older I get, the greater I was. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true for me. And uh, now the reason I'm wearing this, and I'll take it off now because it bothers me I'm not used to wearing a hat, is... Uh, I had a squamous cell small surgery done here, uh, pretty extensive, and uh, so, you know, you get other kinds of cancer, and this is one that's uh, in the, what's they call head and neck uh, area, and uh, they did over 100 sutures and 40 staples, and I was awake during the stapling in the top of my head. Ba-doom, ba-doom, ba-doom. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, and it was very painful after the uh, the local anesthetic wore off. It was pretty sad. I'm glad I scheduled it after Christmas. And then they called me up two weeks later and said I had paraneural invasion. Anybody hear of paraneural invasion? Yeah, it's not a good thing. It's uh, cancer gets into the nerve sheath. And I call it invasion because it rapidly expands. And, and I've learned also that's related to prostate cancer. It's a new thing, and maybe we'll hear something about it. But uh, they wanted to do radiation and follow up, and I'm getting a good second opinion here on whether I should proceed with that. But uh, there's other kinds of cancers, and you want to be attentive to that. And what I wanted to do, subject to a comment, I want to do active surveillance on this thing here. Don't rush into something, and, and maybe that's a program that we could talk about. Uh, so, hey, we got a special program, and we got four speakers, and uh, I made an error calling it a tandem. It's a, it's a quartet that we're going to have, and this is going to be interesting. And by the way, we have an interesting schedule coming up. Uh, Gene and I have laid out a program, and uh, so we want you to keep coming back. You know, this is not, this group gathering is not intended for just one individual. It's for you, and I think it's, what you do is you benefit uh, by networking and sharing, and that's what we're going to be doing next month. Thanks to SBP. Okay, here's, here's the guys that make it run. There's nine that make it run, and we're open for a tenth uh, member if you want to join and help us out. And uh, Lyle can't be with us today, but Gene is here. Gene, wave your hand. And, uh, uh, and then we got me there and Bill Manning in the back. There's Bill. And, uh, and then we have, let's see, John. Where are you, John? There you, John. Hey, have you seen our new website? We got a really snazzy website now. And thank you very much, John. Uh, put a lot of effort into that. So uh, go, go check it out. 
And then Steve, who does our newsletter. Where are you, Steve? There he is. He's going to be passing the basket in a little while here. And, uh, and then we got Bill Lewis, who, who summarizes the meeting. You got a workload here with uh, four speakers. Four speakers. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, you're going to earn your salary this time. Uh, and Bill Bailey, where are you, Bill? He's back for the new year. And then Jim. Jim's out there greeting people. He's a busy guy. So uh, I want you to know this program doesn't work by an individual, and it's a team effort, and we have fun doing it, and we'd like you to join us. Okay, newcomer package. Yellow sheet. Here's the first time. We need to. We got, okay. Did you get one? I did not. Hey, he didn't get one. Okay. Uh, bring them down in front after the meeting, and uh, and uh, you'll get a call from Gene uh, to see if you have any questions uh, or, or what your particular areas of interest are. And uh, okay, our support group purpose: we share patient-focused experience on becoming your own case manager. You have to manage your own case. Your doctor is not going to do that. Uh, he's got 3,000 or more patients. Uh, he gets prepped maybe uh, 10 minutes before you walk in. And it's up to you to keep all your lab notes. Those are lab reports are yours. Ask for them. Copy. Put them in a notebook. Take that notebook with you. Uh, remember when to get your PSA and ask them and so forth. So it's up to you to make your schedule and all that. And really important that you get a, a frequent PSA. I'll cover that in a minute. But we're not a substitute for your doctor. Uh, he's the professional. What you hear is here today, and that includes uh, our, our, our guest speakers, is, is uh, just for your benefit and uh, thought-provoking maybe. And hopefully what this will generate is questions you want to ask your doctor. What about that and how come this and so forth. So that's the thing you have to do. You have to ask your doctor the questions. He may not uh, uh, think about what your concerns are. So uh, take notes. Okay, what we have for you is a brand new website and we got uh, some, a library here full of books and uh, some are for rent and some are to purchase and we have some free things out there. We got, a, got a, the new wellness book that Moyad has written. Here it is. We're going to limited supply, but we're getting some more. But this covers, it says, Beyond Hormone Therapy. It's all, well, new treatments and uh, things like that. And it's a third edition. It's, it's new. There's a whole box full. Don't fight over it. Highly recommend it. Okay, then we have uh, uh, the newsletter that... Uh, that uh, Stephen puts together. It's got a lot of new information, new research, and, and a couple of dumb jokes in there, too, and cartoons. And, uh, and now we have an outreach program, and it's part of your job as a member here to reach out to your fellows. If you've got prostate cancer you, and you have six friends, one other one probably has cancer. If you have a son, he's probably at the age now that you ought to be telling him to get that PSA and ask him about it and so forth, because it's more likely he's going to get prostate cancer because it, there's a genetic trait to it. And so you got to get out there and promote, and here's a brochure that we have out there. Grab a few and take it with you and take it to your church group or your, your poker games or whatever and promote our, our meeting. And we have monthly meetings, as you know. we got a panel of experts next month. This is one of the specials that we do uh, now and then. It's been a while. We'll have members like you, you in the audience, uh, who will give a story about what their experience is, what they've learned, and uh, what they're going to be doing and so forth. It's really, uh, really special, and I'm sure it will touch you, and you'll learn something from that. Now, if any of you would like to uh, participate in the presentation, come see me or, or Gene. And, and uh, let us know, and we'll give you a little guidance on uh, 
a little handout on how to put together a little package, and we'll help you if you need to on a PowerPoint. Uh, then following that, we're going to have a breakout session where we break it out into small groups with uh, each kind of uh, treatment. So if you're thinking about getting a certain treatment, uh, join one of the five groups we have and, uh, and, and share, share your notes with each other. Yes? All right, you found an error? I'm not as great as I was. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> we will correct that. Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> okay. Uh, old guys make mistakes. Uh, okay, now we're going to have a little uh, raising the hand here, and this is for the newcomer's benefit, and then also for, uh, for our, our group of doctors here, so they get a profile of you guys. And so uh, here's goes some questions. How many are here for the first time? Raise your hand, please. Okay, welcome, welcome. Keep coming back. I think you'll find it works for you. Uh, how many have been recently diagnosed within the last six months that you have? That was a surprise. That was a shock. You're a little concerned. You have some anxieties. Understandably so. I remember when I first learned about it. My doctor didn't call me up and, t uh, and talk to me. He just uh, mailed me a note with the lab report. I think you got prostate cancer. <laughs> Go see a urologist. Uh, I don't like that doctor. And I didn't like my urologist, too, but that's something else. <laughs> uh, OK, how many have had prostate cancer for up to one year? Let's see. If, uh, OK, well, that means we're going to get some more hands. How many have had up to four years? Raise your hand. Okay, okay, we haven't hit our peak here. Five to ten years. There, it kind of looks like we got a bell-shaped curve here. Uh, Eleven to fifteen years. Raise your hand. Okay, the curve is coming down. Uh, anybody higher than fifteen? We one, two, and and uh, I, I've got twenty now. And uh, Jack, is that you back there? 27 years. So you young guys, look at that. 27 years with prostate cancer, and he's still smiling. Look at that. Yeah, good for you, Jack. Uh, all right. Next survey. Now, some of you have had more than one treatment, so raise your hand as frequently as the treatments you've had. Okay, the first one, no treatments, but you're on active surveillance. Please raise your hand. We have quite a few on that. Okay. And now, uh, surgery of all, prostate surgery of all kinds. Raise your hand. Okay, now we go to radiation of all kinds. Look at that, the new gold standards. Keep those hands up. Look how many we got here. See? Okay. Oh, oh, I forgot to raise my hand. All right. Uh, ADT hormone therapy. Okay, we got a lot, a lot of us around that, too. Uh, chemotherapy. One, two, okay. They're smiling, too. Um, new treatments. What uh, what's are some new treatments? Our cryo. Cryo. Where's our cryo? Okay. Okay. And, and uh, let's say uh, Zytiga, Extandy, Provenge. All the above. Yeah, all the above, the new stuff. Okay. Etruda. Yeah, Etruda. Etruda. Etruda, yeah. That's... Uh, uh, okay, now here's a good question for you. How many have had recurrence? Look at that, recurrence. Okay, now let me do a special. How many have had surgery and have now recurrence? Raise your hand. Okay, now how many have had radiation and recurrence? Raise your hand. That's about the same. Let me ask a subset. Okay, if you've had surgery, how many have had recurrence uh, after, say, three years? Raise your hand. Okay. How about radiation after three years? Raise your hand. All right. It's, I thought there would be a difference, but uh, uh, see, I didn't have surgery, but I had recurrence uh, after, uh, after 10 years. It does recur. All right. Let's get a subset of radiation treatment that those that raised your hand. How many have had uh, the external beam, uh, raise your hand. That's what I had. Okay. 
And now, how many have had uh, brachytherapy, seeds, the implants? How many? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, three. Uh, cyber knife. One, cyber knife. How you doing? Okay, good for you. Okay. All right. Yeah, SBRT. Okay, how about proton beam? Proton. How many we got now? We got one, two, three, three pro. How you doing? How you doing, Larry? Okay, he just, uh, you finish it up or? Okay. Yeah. Well, we're, we're going to try to get Dr. Rossi in here uh, uh, mid-year and so forth to give us an update on what's going on. All right. Okay, here we go. We need your support. Not a, this is not free. We don't have a big godfather. And so we're dependent upon you folks to give us some money. And we're, uh, we got small baskets, so put in big bills. A big bill has a zero up in the corner like uh, uh, one zero, and uh, if you got one, a bill with two zeros on it, that'd be great. But uh, $10 is, is the norm that we need to keep this uh, function going for us. They're tax exempt. Uh, tax time's coming up, and I know you're, you regret not giving more last year. Uh, we're not related to any religious or medical organization, so please, uh, please dig deep for us. Uh, just while you're digging deep, uh, let me remind you, we have six uh, things that we emphasize in this group. Early detection, get an early PSA, get it early. Uh, you want a too late detection? Just wait. And too late means it may be too late. Uh, get good high definition diagnostics. And, uh, and we, we have a lot of discussion on that in presenters. And get a targeted biopsy. Get that uh, needle aimed at the tumor rather than just a random biopsy. Uh, know your Gleason score because that Gleason score determines what kind of treatment you want. And, uh, and uh, maybe you don't need treatment. Maybe you qualify for active surveillance. And uh, we're going to hear about that next month. Uh, then your treatment selection. Uh, Lyle told me there are 16 different kinds of treatment. And uh, so what do you pick? Uh, so that's what we focus on. Uh, you saw how many are, in, are taking radiation. Some people think that we're not uh, in favor of surgery or we're against it. We are not. Uh, surgery, uh, there's a difference in uh, surgery, surgery and the uh, side effects and radiation and the side effects. There's a difference, and maybe you'll touch on that. And uh, radiation has uh, fewer side effects and less intense. Uh, that's why I chose it. And uh, it has some advantages, uh, but uh, so does surgery has some advantages. The uh, thing about surgery, and uh, this is my perspective on it, uh, surgery is like, uh, for prostate, is like the, the forward pass in football. Three things can happen and two are bad. <laughs> All right? And uh, this is Vince Lombardi. Uh, you know, it can be intercepted, it, it, can be, uh, it can be incomplete, or it can be caught, like we saw just last week and run for a touchdown. And that's the great kind of pass. Uh, it's the same thing for surgery. You may have it done too early when you don't need it, and you could be on active surveillance without any side effects. Or it could be done too late, and then you got to go get radiation, which maybe you should have had in the first place, and then you're just at the right time, and so forth. That's why the Gleason and all that's so important. So, here we go. I'm mislabeled a tandem presentation. We got a quartet, and I don't want to introduce uh, our, our lead speaker, who will then introduce his associates. And this is a wonderful guy, A.J., A.J. Munt, well-known nationally. It's, uh, he's been a frequent speaker here. And not only that, he comes and sits in the meetings to learn something. He's a professor. This is a professor at the university. He's in chair uh, head of, of the uh, radiation medicine 
in applied sciences. He's also, in, on, the, on the hospital side, he is the uh, senior deputy director of the Moore's uh, Cancer Center. And so he's, a, he's an educator, he's a researcher, and he's a communicator. So it's a real pleasure to have you join us. Thank you. So I'm A.J. Mont. I'm the chair of radiation oncology at UCSD, but I also um, took on a new position as the senior deputy director of the Cancer Center. So in that role, I'm very interested in hearing how that Cancer Center can improve, not just the radiation oncology, but others, you know, other family members, other people having access problems, other issues, and everything, I, I'm interested in learning about that too. And so it's not only uh, directed, because I think we have uh, um, ways to improve, and I'd like to, uh, to do that. So in the past, I've done a number of different um, presentations. It's very kind of um, this organization to allow me to give updates every a year or so on uh, radiation, and I've talked about new machines, new approaches, new clinical trials. I think last time I came, I, I talked about the uh, a randomized trial between surgery and radiation that was going on in, in England, which basically showed that they're pretty equivalent in terms of outcomes. There's a, a reduced toxicity with radiation, but the, it's a nice thing because in America, we've never had that kind of data. Usually, you end up going one way. If you meet a radiation oncologist, you end up getting radiation. If you meet a surgeon, you go off in a different direction. But uh, that was a very nice, uh, a very nice thing. So this time, I thought I'd try something a little different. And of course, I didn't warn you. Sorry. <laughs> I did something different. What I thought was I was just going to pick three interesting topics that I know all of you would probably be very interested in. And then I wanted to, but leave time at the end to do a Ask a Radonc roundtable. We have three of us here who are radiation oncologists and just set up chairs and you can just ask questions about anything to do with uh, radiation. So these are meant to be about 15 minute uh, presentations and then we're gonna have a roundtable at the end. So the potpourri that I brought along is some of my uh, colleagues at UCSD. First one, uh, Brent Rose, who recently spoke here on imaging. Um, I asked him to talk about active surveillance in the modern era from his perspectives. He's done a lot of work in that. So just to give his thoughts on active surveillance and what does that mean in 2018. I know that's going to be a, a, you know, a full conversation later by others, but he's gonna give a few things about that. John Eink, who is a professor um, in our department, has talked a lot about brachytherapy, and I think you presented here on brachy. He's gonna give a few things about um, uh, internal radiation. When does that come up? How could that be helpful, and what is that? And then finally, something very different. Um, this organization is devoted to education and getting the patient and family up to date and being involved and not just, doctor, what should I do? Uh, whatever you say, just do that, you know, because that's where we got in, the, in trouble the last 50 years because it's which doctor you meet determines what you got. And so education is very important. We have a, a faculty member that came from Stanford who uh, launched a program. He is not a physician, he is a physicist. And a physicist is the ones that control all our equipment and they do, they're do. they involved in all the planning of how the radiation is delivered and the safety of it and they do all this stuff. But you never hear, you never meet these people. And he has taken, he's developed a program where those people come out of the background and actually come into the clinic and talk to people. And they actually get to meet and talk to human beings. It's kind of exciting. And so this is something that he developed, and it's, the goal was to develop an independent relationship with patients and their families, to focus on questions like, 
How do you know the machine is working properly? How do I know when I'm on the table it's safe? What does it mean to get a CAT scan? I'm get, that's radiation. What, what you, all these questions about technology is the, meant to be supplemented by this program in addition to talking to the physician. So we can focus more on the whys and the, you know, the medical side. And then you all, if you're interested, some people might not want to know what this thing is that's revolving around them and sending invisible energy into your body. Most people in general do want to know uh, what that means and how does it work and why is it safe and how is it, what does it do? So that I brought uh, um, Todd Atwood with us too. But first, I just want to do quick two little updates that involve some things about San Diego. Well, I, I usually talk about these new machines, and there hasn't been too many, you know, CyberKnife and a lot of these things have been around for a long time. There is something new that's kind of, uh, it's interesting. And um, in San Diego, it's kind of interesting. We, you know, have one of the few proton centers, you know, in the United States. We now have the... With the one of the only two of these things. This is called a Halcyon, and it's a machine that no longer does this big thing rotate around you. It looks like a CAT scanner, um, and you go through. The cool thing about this is it's super, super fast, and the treatments in the, in, are in the order of like five to seven minutes. It's very, very quick. That's important because time... Not only is it uncomfortable, these hard tables that you have to lie on and you need to keep you know, still, things can change inside your body. Your bladder fills and it pushes on the prostate. Your rectum can have gas and things can move around. And moving around inside your body is a problem for us because if we can, if things didn't move, we could focus, focus really hard and limit radiation to other things. But if things are moving around as you're on the treatment table, we have to give extra margin, extra, you know, to make sure that if there's movement, we're going to not miss. So speed is a really important thing. It's not only a comfort thing, it's also a accuracy thing. So this, this is exciting. We, um, University of Pennsylvania beat us by a week. They're one week ahead of us, and so that we treated the second uh, patient with this in, in the world. This, but Pennsylvania was one week ahead of us. <laughs> and you've probably been hearing in the news a lot about the Proton Center and changes in the Proton Center. Scripps has broken with the, uh, I guess, or Proton Center has broken with Scripps is probably more accurate. The, uh, so they've changed, and they've gone through a complete reboot. It's been a really exciting thing because it's become what it probably should have been all along, a, a regional resource. It's not one hospital, Sharp or UCSD or somebody having their toy and everyone else is not part of it, which is what you know the news and uh, the advertising for years has been like. It's rebranded as the California Proton Center. It's I think this is really exciting because now it's different organizations like UCSD and Sharp and Palomar and everything can be involved and be part of something that's really good. And I've been really excited by this. So I actually, uh, in addition to you know, all our friends like Carl and, and Andrew and others, you know, Carl would be the one you probably mostly know. Um, I've invited them in to be part of our faculty, and I've placed two physicians at the Proton Center, and I, I just really want this to be a good thing, and I think it is. It's a great modality. It has its role. It, it doesn't replace necessarily, you know, the other EBRTs and things, but everything in medicine is a toolbox of different things. Hormones and you know, different things have a role, and this has a great role, and I'm, I'm very happy about the rebooting of the Proton Center, and it's exciting to have Carl coming in the next number of months, because I think it's really become what it should be. It should have been all along, because it's really gonna be a resource. We're already treating there, 
Uh, this is a little off topic, but here is our pediatric radiation oncologist. He's treating patients from, from San Francisco, from Los Angeles and pediatrics. And I think that's wonderful. That's what it, it's really become what it should be. So now let's move to our uh, potpourri of topics. We're gonna start with active surveillance. We're gonna move into the internal radiation. Then we're gonna move into the education aspects. And then if I could have you hold your questions to the round table, and then you could ask any of the, any of the four of us, I'll sit at the round table too. Uh, sometimes it's fun just to be a Maury Povich and sort of just run or wander around, but uh, they'll be the main people. But um, I think it will be fun because it's three very different topics all, all in one setting. So why don't we start with active surveillance? This is Brent Rose. So um, thanks for having us again. It's always a really uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, I was here a couple months ago when we talked about imaging and very advanced radiation technologies. And, and afterwards, uh, we, we talked a lot about active surveillance. And I realized that there's a really uh, big interest within this group about active surveillance. And, and I'd kind of brushed over that because I'm a radiation oncologist, so I get very excited about radiation techniques and things like that. But uh, it, it made me realize that the most important thing that we do and the most important thing that a lot of guys here actually need to do is decide, do you need any treatment at all? Uh, and, and that's a really important conversation to have. And one of the things that I like best about this group is you're not here looking for recommendations. You're not, you don't want me to say, you should have surveillance, you should not have surveillance. You want to hear the information so you can decide. What are the risks of doing active surveillance for each person? What are the potential benefits of doing it? And I think that's really great. And I think I just want to take a few minutes to go over some of the issues with active surveillance, both the kind of the standard active surveillance, which there is a, a lot of maturing data that we can go over, which is kind of interesting, and then sort of new avenues that, that we can look at for active surveillance and how to make it better and a, a little bit more focused for each person based on the imaging and based on uh, genetics and genomics and things like that. So we only have a few minutes. I know this is a pretty big topic, but uh, we do have to start a little bit at the, at the beginning. So, you know, there was a general consensus that for 50 years, patients were being overtreated. We just treated everyone because we didn't really know. Um, and that led to, as you all know, a lot of urinary incontinence, erectile problems, bowel problems. There's a lot of issues related to any type of treatment for prostate cancer, whether that's surgery or radiation. Uh, so the field evolved uh, often from uh, input from, from guys like you who said, I want to know more information. I don't want to just be told that I need surgery. And we realized more and more that a lot of prostate cancers are really indolent cancers. A lot of them aren't actually going to jump out of the prostate and spread to bones and cause death, but some are. So we need to be smarter about figuring out which are the ones that are not going to do anything, which are going to sit there and just kind of lay dormant for years and years and years, and which are the ones that are actually going to leave the prostate, jump to the bones, cause problems. Uh, and we are doing a much better job than we used to do on these type of questions, but we're not perfect on them. So we can tell, I'll tell you a little bit about where, where we're making progress and where there's progress that still needs to be made. So in order to talk about this, we do have to go a little bit through the basics. And I apologize, some of this will be really basic for a lot of guys, but some of this might be relatively new to a lot of guys. So I don't want to jump through it too quickly. The most important things you have to think about for active surveillance are the, are the three main risk stratification tools. The first being your Gleason score. The Gleason score is what your cancer looks like under a biopsy. And Mr. Dr. Gleason, once upon a time, created probably the most confusing pathologic system that we have out there. So you know, I'm sure the first time you heard about three plus three equals six, or is it seven, is it four plus three, or three plus three? So I apologize, that's very confusing. But Basically what they do is they look at the, the pathology and they look at the most common pattern and then the second most common pattern and each of those two gets a different score. It seems like if it's one to five and then one to five, you should be able to get a Gleason one plus one equals two, but that doesn't exist. So again, one of the crazy, crazy things. So basically the first time they start to call it cancer is if it looks like a Gleason three. And so the, first, the most common pattern is a Gleason 3, the first number will be a Gleason 3. And if the second most common pattern is also a 3 because they don't see anything else, then it's a 3 plus 3 equals 6, or a Gleason 6 prostate cancer. And despite it sounding like a 6 out of 10, 6 is actually the best that you can have, the lowest grade cancer that you can have. The next complicated question that comes up is if you have a little bit of that Gleason 4 component. 
the complication is that it matters how much of the Gleason 4 component you actually have, which is really kind of confusing. But if the first number is a 3, that means that most of your cancer is that sort of more benign looking Gleason 3, but you have a little bit of that Gleason 4, which gives you a 3 plus 4 equals 7. The complication is that a 4 plus 3, meaning you have more Gleason 4, is actually worse. So I apologize for that, but the point is that a 3 plus 3 is the best. A 3 plus 4 is still okay, not quite as good, and a 4 plus 3 is worse and should probably be thought of as a slightly different category, even though it's still a Gleason 7. Then we move on to the PSA. That's relatively standard. You get a lab value. It tells you some number, usually somewhere between 3 and you know, could go pretty high, but if you're in the early stages, it's usually less than 20 or so. And then the exam. What does it feel like when you feel the prostate? Is there nothing, so that we call a T1C, you can't really feel anything? Or is there a small little nodule that we might call a T2A? Or is there a big nodule that's growing outside of the prostate? Did you call that the yes, that is another very important question. Um, we look at what the cancer looks like, but it's also really important to know how much of that cancer is there. Is there a tiny little speck in one of the prostate cores of the 12 prostate cores you got? Or are all 12 of those needles coming back with cancer? And that tells us more about the volume of cancer, how much cancer is there actually there. And the more cores you have, the more of those biopsies that come back with cancer, the more likely you are to have a cancer that can spread and can grow and grow outside of the prostate. So it's always important to know what the Gleason score is and how many of the biopsies are positive. Those are two critical pieces of the, of the pathology. Uh, so the T stage goes a little more advanced than the uh, up to T2, but for the active surveillance, those are usually the only ones we're going to be talking about. Now we want to, using those risk factors, we break it down into what we call now very low risk, low risk, and intermediate risk, and we kind of subdivide intermediate risk into the favorable intermediate and less favorable. So the very low risk, this is the patients that should almost always get active surveillance. So they have only Gleason 3 plus 3 equals 6, so no Gleason 7, none of that 4 component, and really a very small amount of it, only up to two of those needles that go in come back with, post, uh, with cancer. So normally you get 12 needles in a biopsy. If two or less are cancer and it's all 3 plus 3, you're in this very low risk group. Assuming, you know, there's not a big nodule that you feel on biopsy or on the exam, the PSA is not very high, you're probably in this very low risk group. We'll talk a little bit more about the data on surveillance in that group, but generally it's excellent. If you have a little bit more than that, maybe you still have all Gleason 6, but maybe you have 6 cores involved or 8 cores involved, or the PSA is a little bit higher or there's a small nodule, then you're probably more in the low risk group, which is still a good candidate for surveillance, but the risk starts to rise a little bit. The real break point, though, is whether you have this Gleason 7 cancer and then you get put into the intermediate risk group or potentially your PSA is higher, maybe you're a PSA of 12 or 14 or something like that, that shifts you into the intermediate risk group. That's much more of a cautionary area for active surveillance, and we'll go through the data a little bit more in just one second. So to start off, very low risk. So I wanna talk about one trial that uh, was done at Hopkins, over about 1,300 patients who were followed who had mostly very low risk prostate cancer. So in just Gleason 6, a very small volume on the biopsy. And these followed these guys for many years. And looking at, uh, this curve here shows how many end up getting treated. So one take home point for active surveillance is by 10 years, probably about half of the guys are gonna end up getting some type of treatment, uh, whether that's surgery or radiation. At some point, the PSA is gonna rise to a level that becomes concerning, or you're gonna re-biopsy it and get a Gleason 7 or higher than wanna do treatment. So if you do surveillance, it doesn't mean that you'll be on surveillance forever, but it does mean that you can potentially delay it for a while. But a benchmark number is about 10% or sorry, 50% at 10 years. But then we looked at how all the guys did who were followed with an initial strategy of active surveillance. And at 15 years, almost no one had died of prostate cancer. 99.9% .9 of guys were still alive doing well. Uh, if you look at the number that had metastasized, 99.4% uh, had not metastasized. So meaning 0.6% of guys, um, you know, that's about one in 500 guys had had a metastasis at 15 years under this very low risk category. So that's about as good as it gets. You, you really, it's hard to beat those numbers. So if you have very low risk, it's hard to argue doing any type of active treatment for that, just because those numbers are so good. And the risks of treatment are gonna be much higher than that. 
And again, that doesn't mean that you should do nothing if you have that. You should just ignore it and forget about it. You still need to be followed, and we'll talk about what, what that means to be followed. But probably you're going to be wanting thinking that your management strategy is active surveillance first, unless you have a really good reason not to. Then we move up to the low risk category. So maybe again you have six cores that are positive instead of two cores that are positive or your PSA is a little bit higher. Maybe you have a PSA of eight or nine or something along those lines. Active surveillance is still a really good option in these groups, but we, we just think a little more carefully about it in that case. So the big data here that we want to talk about is the PROTECT trial, which Dr. Munt had mentioned. And this is the group of um, about 1,600 guys were randomized to active surveillance, radiation or surgery, and they all did really well. Again, here about 50% of the guys have been treated by eight years, so again, 50% by eight to 10 years is about standard if you're gonna go on surveillance. Um, looking at how the patients did, 99% of guys were alive at 10 years, regardless of their treatment. Again, this is a pretty low risk group of patients, so, so this really hammers home the point that even if you got active treatment, it probably didn't really help a lot. Um, there's a small benefit, we can see that metastases were a little higher if you went down the active surveillance route. So it's about 6% develop metastases. So six guys out of 100 develop metastases by 10 years. So that's, that's a real number. It's not, it's not huge. Uh, and the other issue is that some of these guys on this trial weren't really low risk. They were more intermediate risk. So, so probably some of those metastases came from the intermediate risk group and not the low risk group. So generally, it's still pretty safe to consider active surveillance for the low, low risk. But there are a few things that you might want to consider if you're going to go down that route and you're not exactly a very low risk guy, but still probably a very good option. The intermediate risk group is the, is the interesting question because some guys might might make sense to do active surveillance for an intermediate risk cancer. So if you had a little bit of the Gleason 7, the 3 plus 4 equals 7. Um, but we really have to be cautious about it because these are the type of cancers that do have a really high potential chance of spreading. And high is a relative word, of course, so what does high mean? And that's what we really want to know. Unfortunately, there's not great data in this group because most doctors are a little scared of doing this um, for young, healthy guys. You know, if you're 80 plus years old, then yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's, the risks aren't that high, but if you're in the, you know, 50s, 60s, then we get kind of scared about doing this. This is probably the best data that we have. This is a study from Europe where about 600 guys of all the different risk groups were followed. And if you look, um, if you look at the curves, by 10 years, about 30% of guys, so three in 10 guys, ended up having either metastases or rising PSAs after definitive treatment. So they're in the non-curative setting now because of the active surveillance approach. And by 15 years, that number actually got up to about 50, 60 percent. So that you know, that those numbers are a little scary to a lot of us. Um, so there's not great data, and there's probably better ways to subdivide it with molecular uh, testing and imaging and things like that. But typically, we reserve a uh, active surveillance in the uh, in that favorable Gleason 7 group um, to patients whose life expectancy is a little bit shorter or patients who really, really just want to avoid the side effects and, and know the risk and are okay with that. And that's, again, that's okay. You know, that's, that's what this group is all about, is knowing what the risks are, and you make that decision. Maybe you're okay with a 3 in 10, uh, three in 10 risk of having metastases, knowing that even if you do have metastases, you can get hormone therapy and control it for a long time. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to die of it. So, so that's why it's important to sort of just put those benchmark numbers out there. Again, very low risk, almost no chance of having metastases or dying from prostate cancer if you're followed carefully. Low risk, some chance, somewhere in the 5 to 10% range of having metastases by 10 plus years. Um, so some risk, but not huge. Intermediate risk, looking more in the 30% range, so getting to be a little bit scary numbers from our perspective. But again, it's your choice. It's always your decision on, on what you want to do. So then just what does active surveillance mean? And some guys are already on active surveillance, so they know, but just a, a ballpark, it usually means following the PSA every three to six months or so, just making sure that the trend of the PSA isn't rising really quickly. That's one thing that we always worry about is the PSA starts rising really quick. That would be a concerning factor because that makes us think that there's an aggressive cancer and they're pumping out that PSA. So if the PSA stays nice and low, we're happy about that. We always want to do a biopsy again about six to 12 months after the first biopsy. And I call it here a confirmatory biopsy because one thing we know with biopsies is that there's always a little bit of a sampling issue. 
you have a relatively big prostate and we're gonna put 12 needles into it, but we're kind of doing it blind. So you're hoping that you've sampled all the prostate well, but you don't always know that's true. And probably about 30% of the time, if you had a prostatectomy, you'd find higher grade cancer that would have, would have thrown us off. So we always want to repeat a biopsy within six to 12 months just to confirm, yes, we are looking at just Gleason 6 cancer. Yes, there's not that much of it. We're happy to keep going with this strategy. Um, how many biopsies you need after those first two? That's up in the air a little bit. Some of the protocols have you doing a biopsy every single year, which gets tedious. You know, if you had a prostate biopsy, you probably didn't like it very much. And probably <laughs> you probably don't want to have it every single year. Some of the other protocols, you used it every three years or so. Um, and that seems like a, a pretty decent number. So everyone varies a little bit, but probably at least every three years you'll need a biopsy. If you're talking every one year, that's very close surveillance. And, and we don't exactly know. That, uh, so somewhere in that range. Um, the other question with active surveillance, which is really kind of an open question, is we don't know what should make us treat you. We know that as the PSA starts to rise, that's probably bad, but how fast does it have to rise for us to get concerned? We also know if you, if you get a biopsy and then you get a, a, some Gleason 7, probably want to switch gears and do the active treatment. But that doesn't have to be true. You know, if you have a tiny little point of Gleason 7, is that enough? Maybe, maybe you're still in a risk group where you're okay with, with the increased risk. Or if you had two Bosby, the cores that were positive, and now you have four, has that really changed? Or is that just a little bit of sampling difference? So unfortunately, we don't exactly know. The data has shown that we've done you know, PSA rise where you've gone more than 50% in one year. So if you had a four, a PSA of four, and now you have a PSA of six, that's a concerning rise. Or if it's doubled in less than three years, those are triggers that we think, but those aren't all that well defined. Typically, anything, anytime you come back with a Gleason 7, most people are going to recommend that you move on to treatment at that point. Um, we don't really know if you had four cores and now you have six cores, is that different or is it just sort of something that we think about? That's a little bit of a gray area there. So again, PSA every three to six months, one more biopsy a year, or six months to a year after your first biopsy, and then biopsies every couple of years after that. But we do want, you know, so for those of us uh, who know me by now, you know, I couldn't get away without showing at least one MRI picture. So <coughs> we do want to do it better. And one thing that we know uh, is that imaging can be very helpful in certain cases. So this is an interesting example to me. Uh, so this is a prostate MRI. So if you can imagine that this is the patient's rectum here, this is their backside, this is their front, and this is their right hip and the left hip, and this here is the prostate. When you do a biopsy, the blind biopsies that we typically do, or the template-guided biopsies, you put the probe in through the rectum, and then the biopsies go forward from the rectum. And so they kind of go like this. And you're not really looking, you're making sure you're going into the prostate, but you're not looking for anything when you do it. This is an MRI of a patient that I had recently where he was on active surveillance, and the PSA just kept rising and kept rising. And it was like, well, I biopsied you, and everything looks OK. Problem is, they finally got this MRI that showed that the cancer was way in the front of the prostate. It's really hard to get to the front of the prostate from the rectum. So if you're not looking for that, you're never going to biopsy that spot. So they eventually did a targeted biopsy, which we're all in favor of, found that was a Gleason 8 cancer. Now he's getting aggressive treatment. Um, and so hopefully he'll still be OK. But the point is, we want to make sure that we have all of the information. So if you're a very low risk guy, a very small amount of Gleason 6 on a biopsy, your PSA is low, just go do surveillance. That's, that's OK. But if you have eight or nine biopsy cores with Gleason 6 or any Gleason 7 at all, it might be worth getting an MRI to make sure that we know exactly what's there, to make sure that there's not a spot that we kind of missed with the biopsy and see if we needed to do a targeted biopsy. So MRIs are something that we're pretty excited about, both in the upfront setting, just to make sure that you actually are a good candidate for active surveillance, and then also Maybe we don't need to do all those biopsies. Maybe we can exchange some of the biopsies for MRIs. Maybe instead of every year you get a biopsy, you get a biopsy one year, you get an MRI the next year, or something along those lines. Those protocols are all evolving now, but more and more people are thinking about doing MRIs um, in lieu of some of the prostate biopsies. You're never going to get away from a repeat biopsy, unfortunately, on active surveillance, but maybe you could stretch them out a little bit by doing the MRIs instead. 
the next thing that I think is really interesting is coming down the pipeline, which uh, we, uh, we haven't talked about much here. I'm not sure if you guys have heard about this much. Uh, looking at the actual genetics and genomics of the tumor is something that's definitely coming and we're learning more and more about it. There's lots of different types of tests. Decipher is the one that we talk about the most, mostly because uh, you know it's a good test and the company is here, but there are other ones like Prolaris and things like that. Looking at what are the genes of this cancer? Can we do better than what does it look like under a microscope and what is the PSA? Because we've been doing that for 50 years. What are the genes telling us? Is this a cancer that has the genes it needs to grow and metastasize and spread and things along those lines? Well, the Decipher test and the other tests actually do provide information. So it's not useful for everyone, but if you're in that kind of gray area where you're thinking about surveillance but you're not totally sure, that's where something like a genomic test can actually be pretty useful. So we can see here, this is uh, patients with high, medium, and low risk on the genomic decipher test. And these are metastases. So if you have low risk, very low risk of having metastases. And if you go higher, then the risk is not so low. So you can integrate that into our classic risks group. Uh, so if you have a low risk cancer and you get a low risk uh, decipher score, you have almost no risk of having metastases. So it's sort of combined together can be useful information. That being said, if you have a low-risk cancer and then you get a high decipher score, that might raise a red flag and say, you know, maybe I'm not the one for active surveillance. Or, um, so it's more information. And it's useful information for some people, not for others. Um, but it's something at least to talk to your doctor about. If you're on active surveillance or debating active surveillance, particularly if you're in that gray area, you might ask, you know, is that something that could help me make my decision and help me inform uh, my risk of metastases and things like that going forward? Okay, so that's my talk, and uh, we'll talk, uh, we'll do questions afterwards. So thanks so much for, for your time, folks. Hi there, uh, I'm John Eink. I'm, uh, uh, as Dr. Munt pointed out, a professor at UCSD, um, and uh, also a brachytherapist. And uh, I love talking to this group. I think I've done it uh, every January for the past few years, just to give you guys an update, uh, an update on brachytherapy on on prostate cancer in general. And I like talking to this group. I get to talk about something I'm passionate about. I get to see a lot of familiar faces in the audience, which is great. And um, oh, there it is. And uh, today, I want to talk about uh, the use of brachytherapy as a boost to external beam radiation therapy in patients who are who have intermediate or high risk cancer. I also wanted to comment just briefly on active surveillance, and I thought that was a great uh, discussion um, on. Uh, sort of modern day active surveillance. But uh, I always counsel my patients that if you choose active surveillance, every member of your care team has to be involved in that decision because if you go to your primary physician and they get a PSA and it draws that asterisk on the computer again and, and it's abnormal, they send you a letter saying, I'm worried about your prostate cancer, um, then you're going to panic and, and think that all of a sudden you need treatment again when you've already chosen active surveillance. So my word of advice on that is if you choose active surveillance, just know, yes, your PSA is going to gradually go up. And, and we have uh, metrics, uh, such as Dr. Rose pointed out, about a greater than 50% increase in a year or a doubling time under three years that we can use that to decide if that rise in PSA is... Uh, is worrisome or not. So just know that your PSA is going to gradually go up. You have untreated prostate cancer, but in most cases, uh, that's not relevant to patients on active surveillance. So uh, I think uh, Dr. Rose did a nice job of explaining to you uh, and describing what uh, low risk and intermediate risk and high risk prostate cancer is. So I can kind of go through the definitions uh, uh, briefly here. Um, I enjoy speaking to this group also because uh, you all are here because you're educating yourself on prostate cancer, and, and I think you've done a lot more education uh, than the average prostate cancer patient out there, so I can speak at a little bit higher level than I would normally speak to patients about. So really what I'm talking about is this group of patients here, uh, this intermediate and high-risk group of patients. So. 
those are patients with Gleason 7 prostate cancer. They have uh, PSAs uh, over 10. Uh, they, may, they may even have Gleason 8 to 10 disease. So we're really focusing on not the active surveillance group of patients, but a, but a higher risk group of patients than that. Uh, so in general, the patients I'm talking about have higher PSAs. They have a higher clinical stage and a higher percentage of core involvement. Uh, and that really equals a higher volume of cancer in their prostate gland. So that could be two intermediate risk factors or one high risk factor like Gleason 8, 9, or 10. Uh, and in general, I think it's safe to say that as the volume of cancer increases, the dose of radiation required to cure the cancer also uh, increases. So this is a group of patients we treated at UCSD from 2006 to 2015. Last year, uh, we reviewed the results in about 1,000 patients treated with external beam. So these were all patients treated with external beam radiation therapy, modern-day IMRT to high doses with image guidance. And these are the uh, uh, results. The upper curve is actually a favorable group of high-risk patients. Those are patients with just Gleason 8 prostate cancer, but no other risk factor. They've got PSAs that are nice and low. They don't have a lot of cancer in their prostate. And they fare really well with just external beam radiation. Um, but unfavorable intermediate risk patients, which are the blue curve here, and unfavorable high risk patients, uh, which are, uh, is the uh, tan curve here, uh, don't fare nearly as well. A number of these patients, uh, about two-thirds had hormone therapy, and, uh, and all with high-dose radiation. You can see in these high-risk patients only about a 70% 70, 70 long-term cure rate for those patients. So these are the patients that we can really try to improve uh, outcomes, and I think we can do that with brachytherapy, which I'll talk about. So what I'm really talking about here is a combination of IMRT, so we treat your prostate and seminal vesicles, and if there's a, a high probability of lymph node involvement, we'll also treat the lymph nodes uh, to 45 to 46 gray. That's about five weeks of IMRT. And then within two to four weeks of finishing the IMRT, we either do a permanent seed implant, which is my uh, uh, preferred method of giving the additional radiation, or we can do a high dose rate uh, needle implant uh, to the prostate. So think about low dose rate as being permanent seeds and high dose rate as being needles that stay in your prostate for one, anywhere between one and two days in order to deliver radiation through those needles. And then the needles are removed at the end of the, of the uh, treatment. This is all important. I, I've already alluded to the fact that as the volume of cancer goes up, a higher dose of radiation is needed. We have four randomized trials that really prove this point. Uh, probably the most common, uh, the most uh, uh, well-known one is one done at MD Anderson from 1993 to 1998. And really what they found is that if you give a high dose of radiation, the most significant benefit was for those patients with a PSA over 10. So again, a patients with higher volume or, or more cancer in their prostate gland. The Loma Linda proton trial was actually a group of mainly low-risk patients, so we really can't, uh, they all benefited from higher doses, but we really can't apply that to intermediate and high-risk patients. And then uh, in the Dutch trial down here, you see the, the effect of the higher dose was most apparent in intermediate and high-risk patients. So there are many methods of delivering different doses of radiation. Uh, you can have conventionally fractionated radiation, which, which just means many small doses of radiation, 1.8 to 2 gray, over four to five weeks to deliver a total dose of 78 to 81 gray. You can have hypofractionated, which is a little faster way of doing the radiation, which we're doing more nowadays, where you get a, a dose of 2.5 to 3 gray for a total dose of 60 to 70 gray. You can get low dose, brachy low dose rate brachytherapy, which is permanent seeds anywhere from 120 to 145 gray. And you can get high dose rate brachytherapy, four to six gray per treatment up to 30 gray. So I'm throwing a lot of numbers out there, but what I'm really pointing out is that the way that you give the radiation and how rapidly you give the radiation 
really changes the total dose that you're able to give. So you can see these total doses are really quite different. 78 to 81, 60 to 70, 145, 30. So how can we get away with giving such different doses of radiation uh, with these different fractionations? Well, it turns out that the faster you give the radiation, the lower dose that you have to give to produce the same effect. And there are these complicated biological formulas that we use to sort of harmonize the different uh, dosing schemes and, and to compare brachytherapy to external beam. And when we do that, <clears throat> we can compare different fractionation schemes, different dose rates. You know, with, with the seed implant brachytherapy that I do, that dose is given over six months period of time. So we have to have a way of determining what the dose would be if we were to give it over eight weeks uh, in time. So for example, how do we compare 40 to 45 IMRT treatments, five cyber knife treatments, two HDR implants, or a single LDR seed implant in terms of the effective dose that we're giving? Well, there is a concept called biological uh, effective dose, which means we can throw away all these complicated dose fractionation regimens and using formulas determine how these different treatments compare in terms of the biological dose we're giving the cancer. And uh, you can see small numbers lower dose, large numbers higher dose, and the way that we get the highest BED to these cancers are these combination treatments, 25 external beam radiation treatments and either an HDR prostate boost or a seed implant boost. Uh, but what is the real dose of the tumor in brachytherapy? If I prescribe a dose like, let's throw out 145 gray for a brachytherapy treatment, well, that dose is not the same throughout the prostate. It's not a homogeneous distribution of that 145 gray. This is a low dose rate seed implant that I did a couple of years ago. The red around the periphery is actually that 145 gray. But this yellow horseshoe shaped curve in the, uh, in the center is actually 150% of that 145 gray, which is 215. So that's a very huge dose to that horseshoe shaped area of the prostate. And just to show, this is an HDR seed implant, uh, uh, HDR needle implant I did uh, a number of years ago, showing a similar thing that there's a horseshoe shaped area that receives a much higher dose. So why is that important? Well, the area where prostate cancer is most likely to be, the prostate has four different zones. This is the back of the prostate, this yellow horseshoe shaped structure. And that's the structure known as the peripheral zone. Well, where does prostate cancer most likely occur in your prostate? Uh, different than the slide that Dr. Rose showed where the cancer was in the front part of the gland, the majority of patients have cancer in this peripheral zone. So if I'm doing a treatment that's really going to maximize dose to this peripheral zone, like this one, uh, I'm giving 150% of dose to the area where the cancer is most likely to be. And I think that's why brachytherapy works so well. So what is the proof of this? Well, uh, when we started doing seed implants back in the 1980s and 90s, we only treated the lowest risk patients. So those patients that Dr. Rose talked about that now would get active surveillance, we treated those patients with seeds because we were really concerned there's not a long track record for seeds. Uh, it started in about 1984 with the use of modern day ultrasound uh, that really made a, gave us the ability to get a good seed implant. We only implanted the lowest risk patients. We only used seeds. We didn't combine them with external radiation. And so any Gleason 7 to 10, PSA over 10, or palpable disease as time went on, we eventually started using combination therapy for those patients. If you're a believer that brachytherapy works well, every patient that walks in the door, you're going to think, I need to do brachytherapy on that guy. But if they have higher risk disease, then you're going to you add external beam to that brachytherapy. So some early results sort of uh, proving the point here. 
Um, you know, Dr. Stock and Dr. Stone at Mount Sinai in New York were some of the first uh, to publish data on this combination external beam and brachytherapy technique. And you can see they actually are the first to break it down by, by BED. So some of the patients in this series, they treated uh, really all stages and all risk uh, categories from 1990 to 2003. Some of these patients had brachytherapy alone. So those are going to be the ones with a BED of under, under 150. And some of these patients had external beam and brachy, and those are going to be the ones with these higher BEDs. Remember on that slide, external beam plus brachytherapy gives you a BED of, of 200 or more. And they showed that there was a significant difference in cure rate at 10 years for these patients that had these higher doses of radiation. And the only way to get these higher doses is to add brachytherapy to external beam. Um, Furthermore, they stratified patients by, they looked at these really high Gleason score patients. So patients with Gleason scores of 8 to 10, these really high doses made a huge difference. Patients who were in the high risk category that had these high doses did substantially better if they had combination brachytherapy and external beam. So this was just one of the first publications that really kind of showed this concept. Uh, they also biopsied a number of their patients showing that the chances of having a positive biopsy were much lower in patients that had much higher doses of radiation. Um, the group in Seattle, you know, I, I think most of you who've read about brachytherapy know that it's this group that actually started modern-day brachytherapy in the 1980s. And um, they've also looked at this, <coughs> this comparison of external beam and brachytherapy, showing, again, pretty good cure rates for their high-risk patients using combination external beam and uh, brachytherapy without the use of hormone therapy. Dr. Zalewski at Memorial Sloan Kettering actually looked at comparing patients with this ultra-high-dose IMRT regimen versus patients he treated with IMRT and an HDR implant. Two-thirds of the patients in the IMRT group had hormone therapy only one-third had hormone therapy in the, in the IMRT and HDR group. But the group where he included uh, brachytherapy did substantially better, despite the fact that, that very few of them got ADT. And now a couple randomized trials. So, so these other studies sort of, sort of showed the concept and, and showed some retrospective data that, that uh, these patients with brachytherapy and external beam do extremely well. But there were two randomized trials that were done, too. In the UK, they did a randomized trial of external beam radiation therapy versus external beam plus HDR. And you can see, again, these are the curves of cure. So on the, on the left axis is the percent of patients that are declared uh, with cure at a certain period of time. And the time is on this, this lower axis. And you can see if they had external beam and brachytherapy, they did substantially better in terms of, of cure than if they had external beam radiation alone. Um, the difference, though, and this study was criticized, their external beam dose was pretty low. Again, we'll go back to BEDs. The BED was only 130 gray, whereas in this uh, combination therapy, the BED was 172. So this could very well be the reason why they did so well. Uh, and finally, I think many of you who've come to see me uh, as, as a patient for consult um, heard me talk about this trial that was done in Canada that was presented about a year and a half ago now, uh, almost two years ago, where they treated 398 men with intermediate or high-risk uh, disease. Everyone got 12 months of hormone therapy, and then they randomized him, them to external beam alone or external beam with a seed implant boost. And you see at nine years, uh, the number of patients that were cured in the external beam alone arm were 62.4% versus 88.3% in the brachytherapy boost arm. And these were a, an unfavorable risk group of patients. And there was also uh, more, there were more patients alive in the group that had uh, seed implant, but the dif difference wasn't significant enough that they could say that we, that we have better survival with seeds. 
Um, toxicities were higher. So there's always an expense to pay by giving higher doses of radiation. There are slightly higher risks of both rectal and urinary uh, toxicity. The combination seed implant and external beam patients have a higher risk of urethral stricture, and that was this 8.6% compared to 2.2% in the external beam radiation therapy arm. Uh, this risk of stricture was actually a lot higher than other studies have shown, so there, there are many that question whether it really needs to be that high. Um, this is the, these are, again, the results in graphical form of the ASCEND-RT trial. These are the patients that had the seed implant boost versus the patients with external beam. And you can see between 80 and 90 percent, almost 90 percent of these patients were cured at 10 years. So in my mind, this is the new uh, standard therapy for patients with uh, intermediate and high-risk uh, disease. Not everyone can have seed implant. Those of you that I've talked to about it know that I look pretty closely at your urinary symptoms. And, and if you're uh, already waking up three, four times at nighttime, have a restriction in your urinary stream, you've been on Flomax or Hytrin for years and just aren't happy with your urination, seed implant may not be for you because it can cause six to nine months of increased urinary symptoms. And so I tell all patients this, and that is a reason why we choose to go the external beam route in, in some patients. <clears throat> so finally, you know, on this previous slide, you know, 12 months of ADT um, probably isn't going to make most of you happy when we're sitting down talking about uh, treatment. And is there, uh, you know, I've had patients ask me many times, can we get rid of the hormone therapy from this? What about just radiation alone? Well, there is some evidence, although I think it's not conclusive yet, that if we add brachytherapy to a patient's treatment regimen, that perhaps we can do without the hormone therapy. Um, this is a report from Mount Sinai. These were all intermediate risk patients. They had 350 patients with seeds and external beam and 82 patients with seeds, external beam, and ADT. And the group that, that uh, had uh, radiation alone versus the group that had ADT, they did exactly the same at the six-year point. So perhaps, at least in there, there's retrospective evidence that the use of ADT may not be as critical in patients who are having a seed implant. Um, and the same data exists for the HDR boost as it does for seed implant boost. Uh, Dr. Martinez, uh, who was at William Beaumont when this was published, had 507 patients treated with external beam plus HDR boost. Uh, some of them had ADT, some of them didn't, and they did exactly the same at five years. Um, I've already alluded to the fact that there's a price to pay if we give higher doses of radiation, uh, if we add seed implant to external beam. Um, you, you, these are the randomized trials on higher dose that I talked about, and these are the percentage of toxicities. You can see in this MD Anderson trial, the risk of rectal toxicity went way up when they went to higher doses. Uh, same thing was true in this uh, uh, UK trial. Um, but with modern dose IMRT, uh, which uh, this is a report from Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, the risk was only about 1%, which, which is similar to what we see in our UCSD data of having rectal uh, toxicity. Um, in these randomized trials, when you add seed implant to external beam, about a 2.1% 2 2 risk of grade 3 rectal toxicity, which means you developed rectal bleeding and required some form of treatment for it. So there's still some room to improve in terms of toxicity from these treatments. So what I wanted to spend a couple minutes uh, talking about something else I'm excited about, and that's the use of, of spacers for patients having either external beam or seed implants. So there's a new FDA-approved hydrogel spacer called Spacer. Um, it, the, uh, it turns out it's actually pretty easy for a brachytherapist to do this because it's done under ultrasound guidance. We can target the area that's between the rectum and prostate and inject this material. Uh, it's hydrogel, it lasts for three months, and then it gradually uh, dissolves. It can be done under local or it can be done in the operating room. So just proof that uh, it's not a hard thing to learn is this is uh, my very first case of, of space or in a patient that I did a seed implant on. 
So this blue down here is the rectum. Uh, these colored curves up here are the different doses from the seeds. So red is 100%, that's 145 gray. Yellow is 150%. So you can see these colored curves don't even touch the rectum because there's this big white blob in there. That's the spacer. So it just beautifully pushes the prostate and the rectum away from each other and allows a really safe radiation treatment. This guy is not going to get radiation proctitis. The reason I, I, I did this in the first place is this is a guy with inflammatory bowel disease. There's a disease called ulcerative colitis where the rectum is more sensitive to radiation. So, so he's not going to get that 1% risk of rectal damage. He's going to get a higher risk than that unless I do uh, spacer. So we place spacer. His rectal dose is just about zero. This is an MRI showing prostate is this dark gray thing here. This is a sagittal, so it's as if we cut you open right down the middle and we're looking from the side. This is the tailbone right here. This is the rectum, this dark thing here. And this bright white thing is the spacer. You can see it separates the rectum from the prostate by over a centimeter, and that is uh, way more than we need uh, to be able to provide a safety margin. So spacer has actually been compared in a randomized trial. They uh, the uh, uh, group took 222 patients with early stage prostate cancer. They used modern day IMRT to 79.2 gray in 44 fractions. Uh, the average distance between the prostate and the rectum on this trial was 12.6 millimeters if they put a spacer in, and only 1.6 millimeters if they didn't put a spacer in. And there was a significant reduction in rectal toxicity severity in the group that had spacers, 2% versus 7%. So based on this trial, this was approved by the FDA for, for use in patients. And as of January 1st, we now have a, a billing code for it where Medicare patients can have it paid for. Prior to this, it cost about $3,500 to $4,000 out of pocket. Um, just uh, a look. Uh, this is uh, probably not that helpful. They looked at the percent of bowel decline or of, of uh, bowel uh, symptoms. And you can see that if they had a spacer, they had some uh, bowel decline, but then it went down to pretty low levels after treatment versus if they didn't have a spacer, the control group, some had uh, a longer term decline in bowel function. So in conclusion, dose escalation, uh, in order to give high BEDs, as is possible with brachytherapy boost, leads to higher biochemical control in intermediate and high-risk patients. What we're shooting for is a BED over 160, and you can only get that by incorporating brachytherapy into the treatment plan. Uh, LDR seeds and HDR are both capable of increasing BED to these very high levels and have both been shown to improve control of the cancer. Uh, ADT may not be necessary in the setting of such extreme dose escalation, but if you come see me and you're high enough risk, I'm still going to recommend ADT because I think I don't know, there, there's just no randomized data to tell us that you don't need it. And I'm still worried about patients with Gleason 8, 9, or 10, or patients with Gleason 4 plus 3 that had a, have a lot of cores positive, that we really need the help of ADT in their treatment. Uh, although risk of rectal toxicity is low, placement of a hydrogel spacer can further reduce this risk. Thank you. Okay. Well, this is the, the last of the quadrant here, the two duos. Um, change gears a little bit. So you've heard from three different radiation oncologists, and as AJ mentioned, I'm a medical physicist. And so now we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit more about uh, kind of a unique or a novel educational initiative that we started at UC San Diego, and kind of the thought behind how we got here, and how we've implemented it into all of our radiation therapy going forward. So let's start here. Could I um, see again the hands of those who have had radiation therapy? A lot of you guys. Okay, so can you keep your hands up if you know what a medical physicist is? Okay. It's good. 
I mean, it's not good, but I think this is going to help me get there. Okay, so at UC San Diego, I think now we have 16 faculty medical physicists. How many faculty radiation oncologists do we have? 21. So that's kind of the ratio we're dealing with. So even though you only know your radiation oncologist, if you've had some sort of radiation therapy, there are a lot of us doing something. Uh, I like to at least tell my bosses that we're doing something, but we're somewhere in the background. And as AJ mentioned, oftentimes we think, hey, maybe we should let them out of the background and see if we can be beneficial. So as a medical physicist, we have a lot of responsibilities. Uh, we have PhDs. We're not MDs. So we do a PhD in medical physics at this point. And then we have a two-year residency helping us understand everything we've learned, how we can utilize that in a clinic. And we kind of break down our main goals into, first and foremost, we calibrate and maintain all the equipment related to radiation therapy. So this applies to external beam radiation therapy. So those of you who had external beam with a linear accelerator, uh, brachytherapy, afterloaders, or uh, equipment that goes along with implanting seeds. We also are in charge of establishing a quality assurance program, which we think is very important. So essentially, we determine you know, and perform all these tests to help us eliminate errors. And as new technologies evolve, as things come about, like uh, AJ mentioned the new Halcyon machine, as proton therapy becomes more prevalent, the idea is that we have to evolve also and say, what tests need to be done, what needs to be done in the background to make sure you get safe and effective therapy. And then finally, what I like to think is probably the most forward-facing, or maybe the most important, is we oversee the treatment planning and the treatment delivery. And what that means is we want to make sure that for anyone who has radiation therapy, that we create the highest quality treatment plan possible. A lot has to go into that. And then on top of that, we need to ensure that this treatment plan is delivered correctly. But then we started asking ourselves, these are all good responsibilities or things we can spend a lot of time on, but how else can we, can I, as a medical physicist, improve patient care? So we said, okay, let's sit down and let's start thinking about what can we learn from our colleagues? What can I, as a, a medical physicist, learn from all of our radiation oncologists? And then what can we learn from our patients? Like, let's look at these two cohorts and see what we can learn about how we can contribute more. So we started with radiation oncologists. And I think this is a really interesting story. So this is what's been described, uh, and this is using some language that uh, AJ kind of coined that radiation oncologists face a dilemma of clinical practice in the latter half of the last century. And so I think most people in this room, myself included, when I think of a radiation oncologist, I think of the people we're talking about here today. I think of these you know, leaders in the field. I think of these people that are on the forefront of medicine in this extremely technically advanced field. But that wasn't always the case. So early on in this new technology, in this new field, radiation oncologists were kind of treated as technicians that treated referrals. So AJ told me a really interesting story, and I think this is probably in the 70s and 80s we're talking about here, that oftentimes surgeons would remove cancer and then simply draw the field that would need to be treated, write the dose on the patient's skin, send them down for radiation therapy. Now, that's great if you're a surgeon, you probably feel great about yourself, you just drew on somebody and then sent them to have radiation. But if you're a radiation oncologist, you know, something has showed up there, and, and you went to med school for a reason. You know, you want to participate and actively in this patient's care. That's what you're trying to accomplish here. So this is not where you wanted to be. So luminaries in the field begin to say, though, this is not what we came for. So they begin to participate in tumor boards, multidisciplinary clinics, all of these things kind of forcing them to have a seat at this clinical care table. And that transformed what used to be known as a radiotherapist to what we all know today as a radiation oncologist. So I think this is a really important story, and if, as a medical physicist, I think it would be wise to look at this and learn from this. And how about our patients? Let's look at our patients more closely, right? Who better to learn from than our patients? I think we all are aware of this. Access to the Internet is increasing. Everyone here can agree this is good and bad. In the year 2000, about 50% of adults were online. When this study was performed, almost 90% in 2015, I can imagine we're getting into the upper half of the 90s now in 2018. This is a big deal because, again, there's good and bad on the Internet. 
Next, a study last year came out which I thought was very interesting. Patient-related distress can negatively impact outcomes following radiation therapy. This is a really powerful statement. So we have a study performed showing that distress, things that are causing patients to be upset, concerned about things, that can negatively out affect outcomes. Furthermore, a study in 2017 also was looking at online patient information and as a whole showing that it's way too complex for the general public. And this means that you know, a lot of us out here are technically savvy, we understand a lot of things, but the way this is written is often written for other professionals in the field, not for patients. So when we look at these three things, it's pretty confusing, but it makes us think, hey, listen, if online patient information is too complex, we need to fix that problem. And if they go to the internet, which most people will in this day and time to try to get these solutions here, you're gonna find good and bad things. And doing that, if this leads to distress, then that's a problem. That can change your outcome. So he said, what can medical physicists do? How can we expand our roles to better help patients understand their therapy? And that's how we came up with this, what we're calling the Physics Direct Patient Care Initiative. So the goals are pretty straightforward. One, as a medical physicist, I now establish an independent professional relationship with the patient. And by doing so, the goal is to take ownership of all of the technical aspects surrounding a patient's treatment. And radiation therapy is very, very unique, right? I mean, if you think about surgery, it's relatively straightforward in some ways. We can all conceptualize how a knife is cutting into a patient. Doesn't mean I can walk into a room and cut into a patient and do the right thing, but I understand it, I get it, right? I mean, we all cut meat. Well, presumably a lot of us cut meat. We've had knives, we've done these things. You know, we have a saw. I tried to saw down a tree when I was a child for some odd reason. So we've done these different things, right? We understand how this works, we conceptualize this. Radiation therapy is very different. All of a sudden, I've given you something that is invisible. And I'm saying, oh, by the way, this invisible thing, ah, don't worry, I've got this giant crazy machine that's gonna deliver it, it's all fine. Don't worry about it, go along with your day. So instead of having some just random interactions, we said we need to meet regularly at scheduled appointments with patients, and then allow physicians, allow the radiation oncologists to focus on other aspects of patient care. So the idea is that if we separate these two things, if we take ownership of all the technical aspects, we can help patients get through this very complex therapy and provide our radiation oncologists with more time that when you meet with them, that you can discuss other parts of your care. So then, it was great. We talked about this for a long time. I spent probably two years talking about this at Stanford, and as part of the reason I came down here is uh, AJ and Todd Blicky, the head of physics, said, hey, let's come down here and let's give this thing a go. This is a good idea. So I've been talking about it forever. That's all good and well. I was randomly meeting with patients that were either very concerned about their therapy or just kind of happy to have you know, someone else to talk to. But it, there was no organization to it. So now we had to figure out how are we going to actually make this work? What do we need to put in place to make this work? You know, what are we actually looking for here? So we started with a pilot program, and we wanted to explore the clinical implementation. So where do we meet with patients when you guys come? Where do we meet? How often? How does this fit into the busy clinic? And then learn from the patients. The goal was to try a bunch of different things and learn from you guys how we can be helpful. So how are we best utilized in patient care? We wanted to understand kind of common concerns and questions, like underlying concerns that most radiation therapy patients might have. And then we want to spend a lot of time trying to develop or determine the most beneficial educational materials we could create so patients automatically had this material for them. And then further investigate how we, as medical physicists, complement the care that you're getting from your radiation oncologist. So here's a little timeline of what we came up with and how we've implemented it now. So physicians, you know, you meet with them at the consult. You have your on-treatment visits and as a follow-up visit. Therapists, those who have had radiation therapy, you kind of understand. You meet these therapists at the simulation when you're getting your CT scan. And then you see them every day for treatment. They set you up in your machines to get you prepared for this. We looked at these two schedules and said, okay, what do we need to do? Where do we fit in? So one thing that was clear to us is that simulation. After you've had your consult with your radiation oncologist, that's great. You've decided to go forward with radiation therapy. But what we didn't want to happen is we didn't want you to show up the first day in your simulation and not be sure what was going to happen next. So we are the very first people you meet when you come through for this trial. 
for the first person and we probably like an overview of not just what you're doing there as simulation, kind of get a better feel of any underlying concerns you might have about radiation therapy, any questions you have right off the bat, and then give you an overview of the entire process, let you know when we're going to see each other again, what's going to happen that day, and how we're going to be available. And next, we meet with a patient immediately before their first treatment. And this became really, really clear to us. Because what happens is, at your simulation, people have shown up there, and they're not sure what's going on a lot of times. Maybe they know they've had a scan, they're going to have a scan, they've had scans before. Maybe they think they're going to have treatment that day as well. A lot of questions. But the day you show up for your first treatment, oftentimes that's the first time you'll see, you know, whatever, this modality that's going to deliver this treatment. And that's really important. I don't want anybody walking into the room for the first time, seeing a linear accelerator, and having any anxiety whatsoever. This should have been discussed beforehand. You guys should be aware of it. And if you have questions about everything that goes into when I saw you for a sim to now, that that's going to go OK, I want the first time you lay down on that treatment couch, you to feel comfortable about it. So what we did is we decided we started making educational materials that are dedicated you know, to that patient for all the information we'd like for them to have during, right before their first treatment. So we create these kind of personalized infographics for patients. And so we review their CT SIM. We remind them what happened at CT SIM. And then we show them a little bit of their CT SIM and kind of explain, this is how we know the target we're trying to treat. This is how we keep track of all the other important organs at risk. And this is how we create your treatment plan. We use this information. And then we decide, how many different angles do we need to employ here? Like, how can this you know, really complicated piece of equipment achieve this goal of delivering radiation from multiple different angles to allow it to build up to the one point we want to get the most radiation while keeping everything else we want to avoid to a safe or tolerable level? And then finally, when you lay on this machine, when you're undergoing radiation therapy, how do you know you're in the exact same position you should be? How do we know that everything's working as it should work? We provide this information to all the patients right before they start their treatment. And then we decide, hey, we're going to meet with patients at the last week of treatment just to make sure, hey, everything's been going according to plan, see if there's any underlying questions that they didn't have answered, any things that kind of remain in the back of their mind, or new questions that have popped up you know, on these couple weeks of treatment or several weeks of treatment. And any time during an on-treatment visit, if you show up for an on-treatment visit and you're talking to your physician, and all of a sudden it kind of turns the corner like, well, it's early on in your therapy. You have no side effects yet. But you have new questions about these technical aspects that are surrounding treatment, and you want to know more about it. In this case, AGL pull me back in, come back and visit. We can make sure we get your questions answered. So what are our initial observations here? You know, one, we weren't sure how this was going to work in the big picture. Turns out it's actually pretty easy to integrate us into the care team. You know, uh, as patients, you seem to want more information, and it's on us to make sure that we provide the right amount of information, and if it's the kind of patient who needs little or less, then we have to understand that. We feel like we're able to help a wide variety of patients. You know, anything from this anxious, distrusting, someone who's scared of radiation, you know, confused about radiation, they have these negative connotations about radiation, all the way to the group that are calm, more thankful. They're just kind of excited to learn more about how they're going to attack this disease. And find that most patients just want to be included in this process. And this is a big deal for us, because a lot of what we do behind the scenes is going to change in the, as the years kind of go by here. Things are becoming more automated. We're using all types of math and all types of physics to say, hey, we have all this data, all this past data. What can it tell us about how we're going to treat in the future? How can we use that to better standardize everyone's treatment? And maybe that allows us to kind of work together. Maybe we sit down in the future and we look at all the different options and say, these are the different types of therapies. These are the types of plans we can generate. Here are the kind of side effects we can expect with more kind of, like of a shared decision-making approach involving the radiation oncologist as well as all this data that's going to go into creating the best treatment plan and treatment delivery. And finally, this is a very rewarding experience as a medical physicist. You know, we think what we do is very important behind the scenes, but I didn't expect that getting in front of patients more often, spending more time with them, understanding their concerns, and helping them work through these concerns to be better patients, to hopefully get better therapy, how much that would mean, but it's changed my work entirely. And so just let me close here with our vision. So this is something that, you know, right now is unique to UC San Diego. We're publishing a lot on this. We're doing a clinical trial to see how can we affect 
anxiety, patient anxiety, patient satisfaction? How can we change physician time saving? Can we allow the physicians to focus more on what they should focus on? How do all these things you know, take place? And if we can do that, then we can change the entire field and hopefully change radiation oncology together as well. And so we want to expand the scope of the medical physics profession and provide even more value to our patients as well as the entire field of radiation oncology. So thank you for your time. You want, to, you want to get some chairs in here? Yeah, I was going to move up. Okay, do you want to bring your chair? Uh, my hat's off to our speakers, and the logo I had's inappropriate. Young guys should rule. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that uh, we have a lot of graphs and charts. There's one thing that's missing we don't have a chart of. QOL, quality of life chart. You know, we have a chart showing uh, active surveillance. You, can you imagine a chart showing quality of life? Active surveillance, way up here. Radiation, uh, 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 surgery, and all that. The whole key thing for me uh, that in on uh, active surveillance is you don't have all those side effects. You have one side effect, though. It's the anxiety of a rising PSA, but compared to bone loss, brain loss, I mean, all that, the no side effects at all. More power to you. Did you used to be called a health physicist? Uh, there's, there's a slight difference. Okay, okay. Health but physicists uh, tend to oversee just like a general radiation that's uh, delivered to the entire population. Okay. So uh, I don't think you need me to, to point out the questions, but I just encourage you to scan the group across there and repeat the question. Well, this, I'd like to make this like an open-ended uh, session to just ask the radiation oncologists and, interestingly, ask the medical physicists. So it's a little broader than just ask the radiation oncologists. My, it's exciting for me because I have a lot of smart people to my left, so if I don't know the answer, <laughs> it's going that way. <laughs> so why don't we just make sure, I'll try to make um, sure I scan the room if people have questions. So feel free, ask about your own situation, ask anything you want. So why don't we start up here? Can you still have external beam uh, radiation after a hip replacement? Okay, so the, I'll, I'm going to repeat every question because for the video, um, the question was, can you have external beam after a hip replacement? I'm going to throw John in there. Do you want to do that one? So absolutely, yes, you can have it after a hip replacement. Bilateral hip replacement's a little trickier, um, but uh, in general, you can. Um, protons become a little trickier after hip replacement, but uh, if it's just one, uh, you can still have protons. I think Dr. Rossi will tell you if you've had both hips replaced, uh, perhaps IMRT may be a better option in that situation. Yeah, shouldn't everybody get an early on MRI? Uh, you seem to be saying it's a little more common and it's used for confirming, but it just seems to me that the MRI is awesome for being sure that you haven't missed something important. So shouldn't everyone get an early MRI during the early phase of their, of their diagnosis? I think I'll have Brent handle that one. Yeah, so that's a great question, and I'll admit to being a little bit biased that I do like MRIs and found them useful in a lot of cases. Um, but they're not always helpful, and there's, a, there's an important point in that most of the cancers that are Gleason 3 plus 3 equals 6, and a lot of them that are 3 plus 4 equals 7, you're not going to see on the MRI. So you're just getting an MRI that shows nothing. And that's okay, because sometimes that means that you didn't have a Gleason 8, 9, or 10 that you needed to know about. Um, the issue becomes that that's not that common of an event. So it's not that likely that if you come with a PSA of 5 and a Gleason of 3 plus 3 and 2 cores, it's relatively unlikely that you'll have a Gleason 8 to 10 somewhere else that wasn't biopsied. So the question kind of becomes, is it worth the money to have everyone get an MRI just to make sure the small number of guys uh, aren't missed? Um, from a policy perspective, you can imagine that you'd have to calculate the numbers and all these things. 
from a patient's perspective, I would probably prefer to have that MRI to make sure I'm not the one that got missed, but the, the actual yield is probably not that high. But it's, uh, it's nice for peace of mind also. On the other side, when you're talking about a Gleason 8, 9, or 10 cancer, should you get an MRI to make sure that it is that? Well, you already know that it's that. You already know that you're either going to get surgery plus radiation and hormones or just radiation and hormones. So do you get a lot of added value to an MRI in the setting where you already know you have high-risk disease? Not a lot of extra information. Um, if you're going to do breaking therapy, you do get information because you really need to know about the anatomy. You need to make sure that the cancer is not growing into the seminal vesicles because that could be hard to treat with brachytherapy. So there's a little bit of added value in that higher risk group, but it might not change your practice very much if you're going to get radiation and hormone therapy. So, so on the high end, it's probably not going to change what you do very much. On the lower risk end, there, it's not going to change what you do for that many people, though it might change for, for some. So where exactly the MRI fits in is still kind of an evolving situation, but I'm a little bit more on the pro MRI for more people. Mm. Um, for high risk patients, does that combination of therapy, therapy and external beam, if you know there's bone metastases, one, do they qualify? And two, um, does the size of the prostate or the volume of the cancer make a difference whether they qualify for that or not. Okay, let me see if I, if I remember the question here. So first, for high-risk patients who have metastatic disease, bone metastases, do they qualify uh, for having the combination seat implant, external beam? And then second, does size of the prostate make a difference? So uh, I'll address the first one. So. Once they're metastatic, they really don't fall into this risk stratification uh, peer, uh, uh, anymore. So a high-risk patient with metastatic disease is no longer high-risk, they're metastatic. So um, the seed implant boost or the HDR brachytherapy boost has been shown to improve outcomes in terms of uh, PSA cure rate, so cure as defined by PSA. Yeah, you really are going to lose the the advantage of doing that seed implant if there's cancer outside of the prostate. In other words, I can give you all the radiation in the world to the prostate gland, but I'm still not going to cure that cancer. So in general, uh, a seed implant or an HDR brachytherapy boost has slightly higher risks. It has also a higher chance that you're going to have some urinary irritation. So I probably wouldn't do that to someone who has metastatic disease. Second, in terms of brachytherapy, yeah, size is important because uh, a large prostate uh, can be uh, a, a, the uh, needle paths that, I, that we use to get needles, HDR needles or seeds into the prostate can be blocked by bones in patients with large prostates. And we can't put needles through bones. It's just not, not uh, feasible. So uh, I usually choose patients with prostates under 50 cc's, or if they're willing to have hormone therapy, hormone therapy will shrink the prostate by about 30% at three months. Um, so if it's 70 cc's and they're willing to have three months of hormone therapy, it'll probably get down to around 45 cc's and then it would be feasible. So size does make a difference. If it's 90 or 100 cc's, I can't do an implant on that patient. Prostate size, prostate volume. What is the correct way to express it? Is it in cc's, just like you just mentioned, Dr. Ryan? Not grams? Um, <clears throat> My second question is, relatively speaking, isn't it true that a larger prostate, 70 cc, versus a 30 cc prostate, produces more PSA? Therefore, a person with a larger prostate is not, it's not unusual for their PSA number to be higher simply because they have a larger prostate? Is that sort of a... Yeah, so a uh, couple different questions. So first is, how do we express prostate size? Is it in grams? Is it in cc's? And then the second question is, a patient with a larger prostate, aren't they expected to produce more PSA and have higher PSA levels? Um, the first question in terms of uh, prostate size, we express it in cubic centimeters, milliliters, or grams. And they're all the same. They're all the same. 
because uh, one cc of water weighs one gram. One milliliter of water weighs one gram. And we generally think of human tissue as being the density of water. So, so uh, yeah, it gets confusing, but when a urologist examines a patient with their finger or does a rectal exam, they always say, oh, it's 35 grams. When we do a volume measurement on CT or ultrasound or MRI, it's always in cubic centimeters. And, but they're the same. They're the same. Um, and in reference to the second question about uh, volume of prostate and producing more PSA, I think that's true in the patient that doesn't have prostate cancer. For example, a guy with BPH whose prostate's 80 cc's could have a normal PSA of 5, even though that's outside of the, of the acceptable range. Um, you, uh, the primary care doctors, urologists, always have to weigh prostate size in there in terms of whether we should get a biopsy. What's this patient's risk of cancer? His PSA is 5, but his prostate's 100 grams, cubic centimeters, milliliters, um, uh, his risk probably isn't that high that his biopsies are going to show prostate cancer. But once you've had cancer, I don't know what you guys think. I'm not sure size makes a big difference because cancer produces a lot more PSA than benign prostate tissue does. So I, I think PSA is a marker of cancer volume in a patient with prostate cancer uh, more than it is of prostate volume. I think that's a really great question. We see that a lot, um, <clears throat> in particular in relation to patients on active surveillance, because we'll often we'll see someone who has a relatively large prostate, which uh, does make more PSA than a smaller prostate. So then as the PSA is rising, we're a little bit caught between, you know, is that from the cancer or is that from the normal PSA because normal, uh, or normal prostate, because normal prostates do make PSA. We do not infrequently see a PSA rise to 12, 14 uh, in a person who has a, a big prostate, and the urologist or, or whoever's following them will just say, well, they have a pretty big prostate. When you're getting to numbers that don't really make sense, that's when you really want to think again. Did I do everything right? Did I get my MRI to make sure I'm not missing something that's also making the PSA? So we would expect the PSA to be a little higher if you have a big prostate. But if that PSA is higher than you would expect given the big prostate, make sure you're doing everything you need to do to make sure you've really evaluated completely. And don't just chalk it up to a big prostate. Hmm. Why don't we go back to the blue swell? Um, can you talk a little bit about what happens after the uh, simulation, the CT scan, uh, and how you incorporate that with other scans, for example, I had the SIM yesterday, also had the CT11 carbon acetate scan, and how do you combine those things and then explain it to the patient on, the, on that first visit? Okay, so the, the, it's kind of nice because this is kind of a medical question and a technical question. <clears throat> Simulation is done traditionally with a CT, a CAT scanner, but there's so many as this group was one, I mean, sort of led the charge on other imaging tools. There's so many other great imaging. There's the C11, there's MRI, there's all these things. People like this, be next to this guy next to me, are the ones that then take that other thing that Fabio does, that PET scan, and they're the ones that figure out how to fuse them together. And so, that's a tricky thing because you've had a scan, let's say Fabio in Arizona does a C11 PET, and you somehow magically, they're gonna make those things together. And it's really exciting because then more information gets laid on more information that gets laid on more information because you can do an MRI fusion with a PET fusion with lots of things, right? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Um, so uh, one starting point or to remember for everyone is that that CT sim that's done in the radiation oncology department is different than a CT sim that's done somewhere else. And the main difference is that we're going to put you in the exact same position that you'll be in for your treatments. So the couch, you know, we call these things couches even though they're not at all comfortable like a real couch. Uh, these couches are flat for the CT sim, just like they're flat for your treatment machines. 
And also, the CT stem has a larger bore. So essentially, it's a larger CT scanner, so you can fit more things through it that we use for immobilization to keep people in the same position. The CT scan is also imperative for treatment planning purposes. So in order for us to have a good understanding of how radiation is going to build up in the body, we need a CT scan done in our department that says, okay, I know all these Helmsfeld units or these CT numbers, how that maps to something called an electron density, and then we use that to determine how to calculate dose. Now that's just your simulation. So that CT sim is needed for all those purposes to make sure you're lined up every day the right way, that we contour all these important organs at risk, that we can get you in this correct position. Every other image you have done has to go through a registration or a fusion process. And so we essentially use the treatment planning software to do this. And it can take place in one of two ways. You can have something called a rigid registration, which simply means I take these two data sets and I manipulate them by translating them in, you know, in normal three dimensions, or I rotate them you know, in, like, like in a, kind of like a pitch roll in a yaw. But you just manipulate the entire data set. Or you can deform them, meaning that you actually create new information to make it match up. The important thing here is the CT scan contains the vast majority of information, but these other exams provide some metabolic or functional information, and so we make sure that they're lined up in the treatment planning system for the regions we're concerned about, you know, typically the region that we're trying to target. So essentially all of these CTs, all these MRs, all these PET scans go into one computer system, and then we have experts that line them up and check all the anatomy and say, for this region, they're properly aligned together, and we use that to put all the information onto the CT scan for your treatment plans. I can look around the room and see a number of people that had a fusion done, and a typical one is a person after a prostatectomy whose PSA is rising, and some other imaging other than CT has found a spot. That's where the CT is still done, and then that other piece of information is used to put it together. That's why you'll see from a radiation oncologist is not just interested in the report, they're interested in the data, the, this computer file, because the computer file is given to him and he takes it into the computer and makes them put together. It's because all the, can, all the, you know, Fabio is great because he circles things and points things and makes it really nice, but they still have to put the two things together into inside the computer. So that's why when you've had another scan somewhere else, it doesn't necessarily have to be repeated, especially if it's not that old. If it was five years old, you know, it doesn't help us. But if you had another scan, an MRI at Sharp or different things, it can be often put together. And it's, it's, it's not easy to do, but it's a very uh, useful thing to do. Could I have a, a show of hands? I would be interested in this one question. I'm going to ask a question. Do people think it would be useful in, in patient care to have people like that come out of the, the background and, and talk to people and, and talk about the technical? Many of your questions are going to be medical but they're quickly going to start phasing into this other world of how do the machines work, how is it set. I'd be interested in a show of hands whether that would be useful or not. Oh, great. So are you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> where, where do I put the money in the hat? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do another question. Oh, that's right. You did. That's right. And so I'm sorry. I want to make sure I'm going around. A um, it's a PET scan, Axelman. Yeah, it would be. It, it's able to do. Let's go way over here. I have two questions. Uh, first, you talked about your new Halcyon machine. Yes. How does that compare? It sounds similar to what a proton machine. Uh, no, it's it's okay. The the first question is. So what about this new Halcyon machine? Every once in a while, a machine comes along. It's a new thing. It's a new, a capable thing. This it's this one's kind of interesting. This Halcyon is kind of fascinating because it is what this whole big corporation is moving to. It's not a proton machine, it's a photon machine. So it's the EBRT thing. It's, it can do a lot of things. It can do cyber knife kind of things. It can do tomotherapy kind of things. And it does it really fast. 
But the thing that I'm interested in, in is that it's sort of the future of these of radiotherapy. This this is what a machine is going to look like in the coming years, and it's kind of nice that we're starting to see it. I think it, I've talked to a number of patients that when they go through it, it's kind of nice not having this big multi-ton thing rotating around you. That's you know, it's just you, it's there's no moving parts to the person. It's kind of nice. So it's also I think a nice. It's just less distress. What was your second? Is, um, as a primary treatment, do you, you had a lot of great data on long-term survival with combination therapies and whatnot. Yeah. Is there similar data on surgery versus uh, radiation therapy as primary treatments? Yes. Yeah. So the question is, there's lots of data and all these different things, but is there data comparing surgery and radiation? I assure you, that's a question everyone asks us all the time when they're looking at this. For many, many years, it was not great data. It was the surgeons publishing their data and the radiation doctors publishing their data, and you kind of put them next to each other and go, I think one looks similar about, you know, this, you know, you, but these people are older and these people are this or that. And, you know, so it's hard. That's why that one trial that Dr. Rose and talked about and I um, brought up that PROTECT trial, they actually randomized them. They said, okay, you come in, you can have either, but we're going to flip a coin, you're going to have surgery or radiation. And then they compared them and they came out to be the same cure rates, which was very important. Americans don't like that kind of thing. When you walk into a doctor's office, you tend not to want a coin flip, you know, comparing things. I don't know if I, because I, I often will go, which do you think is better? But we have a lot of biases and, you know, surgeons and radiation. So it was really useful that in England that they did this because it really, they were identical patients that could have either way. And it would have been nice in the United States if we had done this, but often Europe does a lot of those kind of things. They compare mastectomy and breast cancer versus keeping your breast and a lot of good things that answer a lot of important Questions. So there is now good data that says they have the same cure rates. That doesn't mean one type of treatment is for everyone. Some people, surgery is a very good thing. Some people for radiation. But there isn't this idea that one is way better cure rate than the other. It's, it's now can be individualized to the patient. And they, you know, someone who has a lot of heart trouble and things doesn't sound like a good surgical person. Some younger who wants a fast treatment that's over really fat surgery might be a good thing. So there's, you can now tailor it and feel good about that you're getting the same, you're not compromising your cure. So let's go way in the back. How about right up there? The yep. Uh, could you compare and contrast like a combination treatment with the proton and the proton? Oh, one that's better good. Or worse? Combination treatment or one versus the other? Combination treatment using uh, for the radiation, the photon combination, and then the proton. Oh, I, I wouldn't have expected. So the question is asking about a combination photon and proton. It's really annoying because radiation has, oh, no. Yeah, it, it's a combination of photon and brachy and then proton. Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was when Dr. Eink was talking about the the combining external beam with the brachy, how does it compare proton versus the seeds or the HDR versus proton? To me, I think the answer is either one would be fine, but let's see what John thinks. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of the same answer I give patients when they're asking about definitive non-combination treatment. Uh, protons and IMRT, I consider them equivalent. So. You could do combination, 23 treatments of protons, followed by a seed implant uh, two to four weeks later, or 23 treatments of IMRT, followed by a seed implant uh, two to four weeks later. Uh, the toxicity you get from prostate cancer treatment is not from those first 23 treatments. It's from the dose escalation. It's from that boost. It's from the high dose that we're giving to your prostate. So um, if it's 
39 treatments of external beam alone, it doesn't matter whether it's protons or IMRT, the about the same amount of rectum is going to receive about the same amount of dose, unless we use spacer, but they're probably equivalent with spacer too. About the same amount of bladder is going to receive the same amount of dose. So, so outcomes are going to be uh, equivalent. So from a toxicity standpoint, I think it doesn't really matter what you combine with the seeds, the toxicity is going to be from the seeds, or, or the risk of toxicity is going to be from the seeds. And uh, I think outcomes in terms of cure are going to be essentially equivalent. No, nobody's ever, ever argued that proton therapy is more effective or cures the cancer better. The argument with protons is that it's better able to avoid normal tissues, or at least that's the argument. There, there's not much data to that. How about in the cap? Uh, what would you consider a PSA number to be when someone asks you, have you been cured from prostate cancer? I was under treatment two years ago with Dr. Heinz, and they did fantastic the team. But if I was filling out an application that says, do you have prostate cancer, what would the answer be? So what would you consider a PSA number after treatment in someone who's cured of prostate cancer? Um, I'll take that one, I guess. I. Uh, it, there really isn't a magic number. So after seeds, I want patients' PSAs to get down to less than 0.2. But it might take them three to five years to get to that point. Um, the point is, though, we, don't, we consider patients cured if they get down to their lowest level, and the PSA never rises more than two points above that. So we start looking into whether they still have prostate cancer somewhere. Let's say your PSA after external beam gets down to 0.7, stays there, waffles around for a couple years, and then goes up to 1.5, and then 2.5. Well, it still hasn't met that Nader plus 2 definition, but if it gets above 2.7, then we'll start investigating whether there's still prostate cancer. So I think if you meet the criteria for cure, that your PSA is less than the Nader plus two value, you can tell them you're cured. Yeah, um, at the PCR conference this uh, last year, Dr. Steinberg at UCLA, UCLA talked about uh, the fact that they had abandoned brachytherapy completely in the seed and that they're using high dose radiation. In mm -hmm. fact, they have uh, a team and a theater that's all they do, and their most experienced guy, Dr. Demanis, I've been told that he's retired. He's the guy who had a lot of breaking therapy. So, where are they coming from, and why uh, do they have this approach? So, the question is you know, uh, UCLA has. Uh, does their preferred treatment for brachytherapy is, is high dose rate brachytherapy. Uh, I talked a little bit about that involving the temporary use of placing needles in the prostate. And uh, that Dr. Steinberg said at the PCRI conference last year that they had abandoned seeds. I don't know that they abandoned it. I'm not aware that they ever did seeds. So um, I, I think that the, uh, the, there are different schools on that issue, and, and I think it depends on where you train. Um, I trained in Seattle by the guys that developed seed implants, so of course I'm a, a proponent of seed implant. Uh, I think that there are those, Dr. Demanis uh, really spearheaded the use of HDR brachytherapy for prostate and, and actually uh, created most of the rules that we use for giving dose and, and avoiding rectum and bladder for HDR with prostate. And, yeah, as many of you might know, he had his own center, the California Endocura Therapy uh, Center that he had up in the Bay Area until UCLA coaxed him to come to UCLA. So, so that's why they, they do HDRs. They recruited the guy that developed the technique. I think um, there are many considerations as far as whether uh, uh, people do HDR or LDR. Uh, I consider them essentially equivalent in terms of outcomes. The economics are quite different between seed implant and HDR. HDR is much better reimbursed, seed implant is not. So I'm not saying that that's a reason that they chose it, but, but these are all important uh, considerations in, in which form of therapy uh, we decide to use.
I just want to make one quick point. It's a little confusing terminology, the high dose rate versus low dose rate. It sounds like one is high dose, meaning higher, more radiation, and one is lower dose. They're actually identical. It's the dose rate. It's how fast the radiation is given. So the seeds give the radiation over a couple months. The, um, the HDR, high dose rate, gives it over a, a, you know 10 minutes. So it's not that you're actually getting more radiation. You're getting the same effective radiation dose. It's just how fast the radiation comes out. So uh, basically, like Dr. Rank was mentioning, we think that effectively they're equivalent for control of the cancer. So it's the same effective amount of radiation, the same expected control of the cancer. It's just that it, the radiation is delivered faster with the HDR versus LDR. And to show our collaboration, because a lot of, it, a lot of people, um, when they meet me, will say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to talk to Dr. Rossi. Is that, I don't mean to be offensive, and it's separate. We're the same group, we're friends, we're close, we work together. Don't ever feel that it's us versus them. And now with the reboot of the Proton Center, Carl's on our faculty, we're part, we're friends, and never feel he is an expert in proton therapy. He's a great person to talk to. He knows he's been doing this for many, many, many years. In, in, in light of that, we're actually exploring putting an HDR prostate program at the Proton Center. They have a lot of uh, shielding and a lot of good things, and we're exploring whether we can um, work together on a program like this. And I think the, uh, when someone stands, when the, our boss stands up, it means we're going long. Uh, well, it doesn't mean you're going long. <laughs> we officially uh, concluded the formal aspects, but if you yes. guys want to stay around and you people want to get down here and ask questions, yes. you're free to do so. But I want to thank you, Greg. Great. Great. Great.